Hello everybody, welcome to Ageless Rock channel where megalithic sites can be seen from a different perspective. Today, we are going to check out a Hindu site in Bali, a province of Indonesia. It is a popular site among tourists who are already in Bali. At the tip of the pin lies a very enigmatic Hindu temple. It is called Gunung Kawi Temple. Gunung means mountain and Kawi is an old Javanese language spoken in Bali and Java. So, Gunung Kawi doesn't mean much in relation to this site. However, to get there, you have to know that Gunung Kawi or Mount Kawi is in Java region, while Gunung Kawi Megalithic Temple site is in Bali Island, which is in Nusa Tenggara region. Bali Island itself is a province of Nusa Tenggara. This temple is still a mystery today, just like all the megalithic temples around the world. No one knows what happened here. There is no historical record. The only assumption of human history involved here goes back to approximately 1,000 years ago. This temple site is in a valley. So, archaeologists call this Valley of the Balinese Kings. Just like in Egypt, we have the Valley of the Kings. Because archaeologists believe the monuments are not just tombs. They are awesome tombs and can only be for the kings. You will read about this site as tombs for the kings, but I highly doubt that is the case. Let's take a look at the yellow box, which is an entrance to the magical megalithic site. But it is not just an ordinary entrance. If you are wearing megalithic lens, you should be blown away that this is an entrance sliced out of the bedrock. Instead of a simple stairs going down from the side, which is what normal human instinct would do, this bedrock trench was sliced like clay. I don't think anyone in their right mind would slice a bit rock into a trench so that they can reach the other side which is only about 50 meters away, based on my estimate on Google Map. These megalithic trenches can also be found at Tagliata Etrusca in Italy, Lalibela Church in Ethiopia, and Damrajeswar Temple in India. These long cut into the bedrock with odd shapes and sizes can only be done because it was easy if you have the right tool. As you reach the end of the trench, you will come to a doorway. This bedrock was sliced to finish as a doorway. If this was done by humans meant for humans, then the doorway is definitely too high. Locals have been carrying offerings for their numerous rituals on their head long before the Europeans arrived. This type of crazy idea as a passage from point A to point B happened in the past because it was easy to do. Someone had tools or machines that can handle bedrock like clay. These are mega projects that could not have escaped history to the point of lost civilization scenario. As you exit the entrance, you can see there are four monuments in oval cavities in just a stone's throw away on the left. It is quite a sight to behold. The monuments themselves are 7 meters tall. They are not Balinese in architecture and they do not have the typical Hindu gods and deities. But I want to draw your attention to the impossible task of this project. The monuments were not created straight out of a bedrock cliff, even though it already has a cliff. You can see from the south end of the temple area that a huge amount of bedrock was removed prior to carving anything. If Balinese need four monuments on the cliff, they could have done it by removing just a small portion as shown in the triangle. Instead, they chose the hardest way. This is by far the biggest undertaking of the project for these four temples. After removing a gigantic block of bedrock portion is completed, 
Chiseling four monuments is the easier part if that ever happened. As far as I can see from Google Earth, this west side of the temple complex has an impossible structure stretching approximately 25 meters wide, hewn out of a bedrock cliff to get a cliff. Everyone comes to Tampa Siring will be amazed by these four monuments. I am not only curious why a huge chunk of bedrock was removed just for a front yard. Did the Balinese feel that four monuments are not enough and so they repeated the same thing but this time with five monuments? This is another stretch of bedrock removal on a cliff to get a cliff so that it can have a bedrock front courtyard. I wonder what is the logic of all this extra harder to do project to have a temple that has no sign of religion or local architecture. It is completely on its own and escaped history completely. These five monuments on the east side, just across the sacred Pakarisan River, is a pre-Hindu monument. The Balinese here had their own religion long before the arrival of Hinduism. They have plenty of rituals for thousands of years and are still being practiced today. Balinese people has their own religion and legends intertwined with Hinduism and is called Balinese Hinduism. I can tell you the front courtyards on the east and west sides are not necessary if you just want a pyramid on a square pedestal. There is a standalone temple on the south side to prove that. There are 10 temples here and this is typically referred to as the 10th temple because it is isolated on the south and needs a little bit of direction to get there. This shrine is unique because it is located among the much older structures that no one knows how it got there as far as mainstream archaeology is concerned. To hew this out of bedrock cannot fully explain the amount of work done. The vertical cut you see in the photo already shows it is not a work of any metal tools that Balinese had in their hands 1,000 years ago. This rock splitting technology is not something we can do with chisels. The unknown ancient builders have the technology to split rocks the way we can barely comprehend, and they did the same to a rock at Al Nasla at Tema Oasis in Saudi Arabia. This is a laser cutting technology to those who believe in aliens. To the mainstream, ancient people are simply very skillful and very hardworking. I don't know how the entire front courtyard can be made, but I think the clue is on the top of the bedrock. Look at the long horizontal striations. I can only imagine that a big and powerful tool went through the cliff to create a sharp vertical drop before any temples were created. These 10 temples look like full 3D carvings, but they are actually only a few feet deep from a deep cavity. Bali Island has plenty of tourist spots to offer and these 10 monuments are not to be missed, whether you believe they are temples or tombs. But these are not the only mysterious monuments here. There are plenty of Vihara cells on both sides of the valley. It defies logic to have such level of difficulty to create a Vihara just for meditation. There are many niches with unique architecture. They are called Vihara because monks use them for meditation. These so-called viharas have features of a rectangular window and a false window in horizontal direction and a small entrance. The ceilings are too low for a normal adult to stand upright inside the hall. There are so many cells here that it is impossible for us not to know anything about it other than it is sacred. Although we call these viharas, it is actually neither Hinduism nor animism can explain their existence. If this can be chiseled out of a bedrock with ancient chisels, Balinese would have done the same but with higher ceilings and call it home. 
at the main complex area, there is a monolithic structure that no one knows what it is. It looks like a house with a roof. Some refer this as stone house. If not for this unnatural gap, this stone house would have been known as top-down bedrock carving. To hew this entire area out of bedrock to have a stone house and a few viharas is way over and above the needs of any religion. Hindus did not do this because there would have been gods and deities all over. Balinese did not do this because it is of unknown architecture. There would have been plenty of ancient chisels if that is what they used. So what are the odds that Balinese were also into top-down bedrock carvings just like Lalibela Church in Ethiopia, Kailasa Temple in India, and Takhi Rusta Monastery in Afghanistan? What are the odds that when Europeans rediscovered these sites, the locals already said they do not know how it got there? Among all the cells, there is one that stands out. It has a small entrance and very spacious on the inside and is therefore very dark from the outside. But this blurry photo on the left is clear enough for me to see that the ceiling is a triangular shape, just like the Queen's Chamber of Khufu's Pyramid in Egypt. Although Gunungkawi was rediscovered by a Dutch researcher by the name H.T. Dumpster in 1920, we haven't made much progress in solving the mystery of this megalithic site. Local legends and folklore can only provide some non-scientific clue which mainstream cannot use. We can only guess this is an 11th century temple. Despite such a great achievement in reshaping bedrock for kings, there isn't much you can find about this megalithic construction. The connections through inscription is very vague at best. On the eastern side of five towers, the first temple from the north has a Kadiri quadrat inscription that says Haji Luma Ing Jalu. It is assumed Jalu is the Pakarisan River and it is believed to be for King Udayana. Some translate it as the king made a temple here. Even these four words do not mention anything about a king. Other variation translate it as the king was buried here in Jalu. Jalu is believed to be Pakarisan River and the king is believed to be King Udayana. The last but not least in translations is believed to mean the king was enshrined in Jalu. I don't know how a king was implicated to this monument other than it is so awesome it must be for a king. In another inscription that says Roa Nakira is interpreted as Roa Anakira meaning two children. This is further interpreted as two of the three sons of King Udayana. The two sons are Marakata and Anawungsu because they rule in Bali while Ailanga rule in Java. Balinese knew about this place since forever and they worshipped their animistic gods and deities. From the photo, it seems to me the population was too low to even keep up with maintenance. When the Dutch were here, this was like a kingdom of a lost civilization. It was a mind-blowing rediscovery. But to the Balinese, it is nothing new. They were clearly not making use of this place like what they are doing today. The locals had from very little to no clue what happened here. It was a feeling of awesomeness that has to do with the gods and therefore it must be sacred. Gunung Kawi has been animatic since Balinese rediscovered them followed by the Dutch rediscovery. Balinese used them as shrines, temples of their ancestral gods, Hindu worshippers and Buddhist hermits. The West simply calls this archaeological site. Well, that's all for today. 
I hope you enjoy this short presentation on Gunung Kawi temples and niches. See you in the next video and have a wonderful day. This is Bernie Ong signing out. Om Shanti 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 Om.